All right, welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Let's go ahead and I'll put down the whiteboard and we can get the guide up to share. So what I'm going to do here is, I'm, because this is just going to make things a little smoother for us, um, I'm just going to pull up the entire guide. So this is the entire guide for the final project. Now in your course, we do have it broken up by milestone, but really it's just the same thing, um, everything put together. So uh, we're just going to skip down to the parts that are covered in this milestone, milestone two. So you already did the introduction to your paper, which covers the purpose of your paper, which is very common in academic writing, and the history of the company that you chose. And then we start the section for milestone two, which has, um, this actually has two sections. So it's got the supply and demand condition section, which has two critical elements that you're going to be graded on. And then the price elasticity of demand section, which has three critical elements that you'll be graded on. <clears throat> All right, so first question before we get into things. Tanya asks, um, do we use one annual report? Um, so Tanya, what I would suggest, definitely start with the most recent report. So it sounds like your company has their 2016 report out. Um, some companies have different fiscal years, so your company there's a chance that they might not have their 2016 report out yet since we're still in January. Um, but ideally you get the, the latest report that's available. And um, I see your hand up, Debbie. Uh, you can just put your question in the chat actually and, and I'll, I'll get to it since um, the participants aren't able to, um, to ask questions with audio. So the start with the, the latest report that you have access to and then you might need to go back and look at some older reports um, for a lot of the stuff here uh, and we'll talk about this in this section actually we recommend getting about at least five years of data let's say for like the revenue um, talking about the company's revenues that they that they have each year um, you know you really want to see a trend and that's why we give a minimum of five years as sort of a, a guideline so you can really see a trend. Um, depending on the company and how they do their annual reports, they might give um, historical revenue, annual revenue for the past three years, some give it for the past five years. So if your company and their annual report only goes back three years for comparison's sake, I would recommend going and getting some older reports. And also the annual reports have tons of really, really good information about the business, like the actual business, not about their stock performance or about, um, you know, who the chair person is and, and you know, and, and things like that, but about the actual, uh, how, how they're supplying their product and who they're competing against and what customers are demanding, um, things like that, that you're going to want to read through. So definitely start with the first one, but then you might want to also read those same kind of things from the 2015 and 2014 annual reports to see how um, that competitive landscape is changing for them and, um, and how those demand trends that they're facing are changing, because that's some of the stuff you're going to talk about here. Um, yeah, Tanya, it's not um, so much that it's it's required. Um, so the and, and we'll talk about it as we go through each of the elements. But it says to look at the trends over over time for some of these things and analyze information and data. So we're giving you the recommendation of five years so that you can get a full picture, um, which is why we have this guide here that that spells it out for you um, with that recommendation. And then again, that's that's kind of a, a good baseline. Some students do more, um, especially maybe if if there was something really interesting that happened over a 10 year period, maybe they saw a really big boom and they want to show that. But five years, we feel as you know, the instructors for this course is a good baseline. So, um, so yeah, data from 2016 back to about yeah, or 2012 technically. That if you include 2012, that would be that would be five years worth of data. Yep. So, um, yes. Uh, so Kelly asks if it would be ideal to share that in a graph. Yes, so that will be part of your supply and demand section here, but it's related to the second critical element. So where you're actually sharing um, information and data related specifically to your company that you chose. Um, 
the graph is mandatory in the sense that to get full credit on that critical element, it does ask you to analyze it graphically. So to show some sort of graph and to talk about what the graph is, um, is telling us in your paper and make some sort of conclusions um, based on what you see in the graph, that's, that will get you full credit on that, on that critical element. Um, a lot of the stuff you can find, um, it's, you can find in, in their annual reports, sometimes they, they show graphs. A lot of websites will have this already compiled, um, like stock, stock type websites. Um, you don't want to get the stock information, but they'll, they'll share company information like revenue that they already have in a graph form, like Yahoo has a stock page and there's some, some other websites along those lines. Um, but it's, it's super easy to make your own graph and it's, it's probably a good exercise for you to practice. Um, just, you know, to put the five numbers in for the past five years um, and just make a simple bar graph and pop it right into your paper. But if you do find one that's got five years of revenue data, you can, from, from a website or from the annual report, you can absolutely, you know, just take a screenshot of, of just the graph and pop it right into your paper and cite it. That's fine, too. Um, so Julia asks if it's better to make your own or use the one from the annual report. Um, Julia, if the one from the annual report has at least five years of data, then that would be fine. Um, and you might also want to see if they're including other information in that graph. Sometimes I've seen students share graphs that have some extraneous information. So it might have revenue, but it also has some other stuff going on that really isn't relevant to anything that you want to talk about in your paper. So I think just in terms of keeping your paper to the point and pretty simple, you want to just include what you need. So you don't want to be putting in a graph there that's got lots of information that you're not going to talk about. So just look out for those sorts of things if you're going to borrow a graph. But it's absolutely fine to borrow a graph if it's exactly what you need. No problem with that. Just got to make sure you cite it. And no matter what, you're going to be citing the data that you get, because obviously you have to get the data from somewhere even when you make your own graph. So any graph that you create, if any graph that you have in your paper, whether it's borrowed as a screenshot or created by you, is going to have some sort of citation. So then Christine asks, do we make inferences on the trends? Um, yes, definitely. So we'll get to that. Um, let's talk first about the first critical element before we get into that, Christine, um, because the trends in the, in the revenue itself um, will discuss more when we review the second element. Um, it might make a little bit more sense if we review the first element uh, first. So the first element in the supply and demand section is asking you to evaluate trends and demand over time for the type of product that your firm makes. So we have an example paper that we share in the class on Hershey. So in that case, the student would look at the trends and demand for candy bars, chocolate, and they also sell gum, they own Wrigley's, and chewing gum in general. Um, now, that doesn't just mean, excuse me, that doesn't just mean Hershey Bar branded items or other brands that they make, but the general demand for those things. So if demand for chocolate is increasing in the past five or so years, you'd want to let the reader know that in your paper, give some evidence, and talk about why that's happening. So that's just a pretty basic example of, of a trend in demand over time. And we've got here the determinants of market demand. So these are some of the things that might explain why demand for chocolate, for instance, is increasing over time. Is it income? People have more money, so why not spend some more of it on chocolate? <laughs> um, is it the price of related goods? Maybe other kinds of um, sweet treats are, are changing price, and so that Im impacts the demand for chocolate. Um, people's tastes, if for some reason chocolate becomes all the rage or uh, Hershey comes up with some great products that just really appeal to people's tastes in that moment, maybe that's why demand would be increasing. Um, or maybe they got some really great sponsorships that's impacting people's tastes. Um, population and demographics, let's say candy bars are more often eaten by young people. Um, so if the population was getting younger because more people were having kids, then you might expect that to increase demand for chocolate in that instance. And then, of course, expected future prices. Um, if for some reason people across the country expected 
the uh, the price of their chocolate bars to go up in next year, they might buy more now. So that is more of an impact on things that are one-time purchases, like your washing machine, your dryer, a car, a house. Um, maybe not so much for something that you eat, maybe buy every, every week or so. But those are the things that affect demand that you're going to want to sort of have in the back of your mind and you, use those as your guide to help you explain why demand is trending the way that it's trending. All right, I'm just making sure I haven't missed any questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, you just need to submit this section. Um, some students do want to just keep the document all together and just sort of add it to milestone one. Um, for me personally as an instructor, that isn't a problem, but just keep in mind that your instructor is not going to go back and look at any adjustments you made to milestone one. Um, so in some senses, it might be easier to just submit it separately, um, and it makes your instructor's job a little bit easier to find exactly um, the sections that you're working on here. But either way, you'll, you'll be okay. So that is basically how you're going to look at the trends and demand over time. Um, your company might have more than one product or service that that is a you know a big part of their business. Um, so you know if you're picking an automobile company, let's let's say you're doing General Motors, you might want to talk about demand for cars, trucks, and SUVs maybe a little bit separately. Maybe there's a big demand for um, smaller cars, but the demand for trucks is going down. So you might want to talk about those things separately. It really depends on the, the company that you chose. If you chose a company like Netflix, um, they pretty much just have the one service. So that would be a little bit more straightforward. Um, so Nadine, that's a, that's a really good question um, that I think throws a lot of students. So Nadine asks about um, the introduction, to change the introduction to include both. So the introduction that you wrote in Milestone 1 is the introduction for your entire paper. Um, it's not the introduction just for what you wrote in Milestone 2. No, no, that's okay. I, I don't want you to apologize because that happens a lot. And I think it just, um, this is why we have this webinar here, <laughs> to help clarify some of this stuff. So your paper is one paper. And to make sure that you're not overwhelmed at the end of the term having to write a 10-page paper, we've broken it up into chunks. So the first chunk you did in week two, and now you're doing the next chunk. This is just like if you cut your paper into three pieces, this is the second piece of it, if that makes sense. Um, so the first part was basically if you cut that section of your paper off the entire paper and you just wrote it as if it were one big document, but you only wrote the first bit. So imagine like somebody writes a novel but when they give it to their publisher, they've only got the first couple chapters done. It's still all part of one novel. That's kind of what we're doing here. So you don't need an intro. If you just want to submit just Milestone 2, you're just going to start right here on this page, Supply and Demand Conditions. You can still have a title page, you know, if you want to you know, have a Milestone 2 title page. But in terms of what you're going to be graded on, it starts right here at Supply and Demand Conditions. So I hope that I hope that clears it up. Um, you you don't Teresa you do not need an abstract for um, for this milestone. No. And if you notice the um, the templates that we have, so this exact thing that we have that I'm showing you right now, but broken up by milestone that's shared in the course does have a title page that you can customize for each. Um, for each milestone. So instead of having the title of the paper, it will say, you know, milestone two. Um, just, and that's just so when you submit it, you know, your instructor knows that you've submitted the right assignment um, and that you know how everything's broken up. But at the end of the day, this is going to be one paper. You're working on one paper. You're just working on it in pieces. Okay, so the abstract portion, um, you're not, besides the, the writing portion of your, of your grading rubric, you're not graded on the content of your abstract. So if you look at the rubric, which we talked about in the last, um, in the last webinar, 
there's nothing in the rubric ex itself where you get graded other than at the very bottom there's it's called articulation of response i think on the final paper it's worth about two and a half percent of your grade and it includes everything all your citations your grammar your punctuation um just the flow of your writing in general so that's really the only place where the grading of the abstract could come in but in terms of content you're not going to be you're not graded on that um, and really, you might not be totally prepared to write an appropriate abstract until you're finished with the paper. So you could have a placeholder for your abstract right now, um, just so your instruct you can let your instructor know that you're it's something you're going to do. But in terms of for the milestone, no, it's not something that um, that you need to be submitting because you're not submitting the final draft of your paper. Yeah, so definitely, and, and you know, if your instructor is looking for it, um, the the abstract is going to be pretty similar to your to your purpose statement from la the last milestone. So, even if your instructor is looking for that just to see that you've that you've got it ready to go for your final, it should be very similar to that, and, and shouldn't take a lot more time. Ideally, though, you won't write it till the end because you're going to have some conclusions that you make at the end of this paper that you're not prepared to make yet since you haven't done your entire analysis um, that, you'll, that you might want to incorporate into your abstract. So you won't be able to do that yet anyway. All right. So um, before I move on to the second element in this section, does anybody have any questions about um, evaluating the trends and demand over time? A couple of people typing, so I'm just going to hang on in case they've got questions. Yeah, Tanya, um, that's a good question about where to find it in the annual report. If if there were some standard place like this page number or this title section where you found that information, I would. It would be something we included in the course. Every every company has a little bit of leeway in terms of how they structure their annual report. I mean, they have to include certain things um, by requirement by the SEC, but but in terms of how they organize the report itself, they, they do have some leeway. A lot of companies, and Ellen and Kate, if you want to jump in and help me with some examples, um, might call it a business overview, and usually it comes. Um, before they get into the the data about revenue and costs, so they'll they'll have maybe a couple pages of of text of writing where they sort of explain how the business is going, how are sales going, how's demand, what are customers looking for, what does our competition look like, um, things like that, and then from there they share their sales data and their their cost of production data, um, stuff like that. So that's usually where you can find it in the annual report. So once you find those the tables where they show, you'll see a line for sales or revenue and then a line for, oftentimes it's called COGS, cost of goods sold, or it's called cost of production, things like that. You'll see a whole, whole table of, of that sort of financial information that basically at the end tells you how much profit they're making. Usually the business overview that you want to read um, comes around that, that table of information. Okay, and, and yeah, Melora mentions that there's a video post on YouTube about how to read through the report. Um, yes, there there is one, and, and there's lots of them on um, on YouTube as well. I mean, I think we found one that we shared, and it's it's in this entire final paper guide, but it's it's a little further down because it shows you exactly where to get the cost data that you need uh, in the annual report. Um, Yeah, um, so Julia asks um, about the, the focus on one product. Um, a lot of the times students, in, 
and I find that students generally can, I don't know if, if Kate, you, you see it, see it differently. Um, I mean, it, it depends on the, the company and, and how much revenue they get from it, but you know, a company like Nike, um, I don't know how much of their sales comes purely from shoes. So it might be necessary to, if you're looking at revenue and cost data to, to sort of understand the other aspects of their business. Um, but certainly for a company like, you know, like General Motors, you would have to look at, you know, cars, trucks, and SUVs. Um, and, you know, talk about demand in general um, for, for vehicles. I mean, at the end of the day, you can sort of have an overarching, you know, with General Motors, they're all vehicles, right? They're different kinds of vehicles, but they're all vehicles. Um, with Nike, you know, they still mostly deal with athletic apparel, clothing and shoes. Um, so, you know, I would definitely, if you have any questions about that, work it out with your instructor. Um, but we want to make sure that you can do your job and that your paper's not terribly long, longer than it needs to be. Thank you, Laura, for sharing that. Yeah, Ellen brings up a good point, too, that they'll... They'll talk in their um, in their in their business overview or however they refer to it in their annual report about each one, um, because you know they, they know which aspects of their business are are most important and most profitable and and are growing. So you know it might be that they have a small piece of their business that's just kind of there and isn't really a big part of things that you want to analyze. So you might not pay much attention to that, um, depending on the company that you have. All right. We don't have too much time left, and we do have quite a bit more to cover. Um, I'm glad you guys have so many questions, so I, I do want to make sure that we're addressing the questions that you have. Um, I think we've talked a lot about the second element. You understand about the revenue piece of it. You want to show it doesn't have to be revenue. That's the most common thing. Um, it could be sales amounts. So again, if I were to use the General Motors example, you could talk about number of vehicles sold. Um, with Netflix, it might be something like um, number of subscribers. Um, things like that. So revenue is obviously the most, it's the most obvious sales numbers, but there are other ways to show a similar sort of trend. Um, so basically you want to, you're looking at analyzing that information and understanding how your firm in particular is responding to the demand trends and um, supplying the market with their product. So we've got some guidance here about that. But once you get the data, then from there, it's, it's pretty easy to, um, to satisfy this element. OK. So if we skip ahead, I want to make sure we go over price elasticity of demand with the little bit of time we have left, because it, it is often tricky. So this, this section has three elements. Um, the first one is asking you to analyze information and data to justify how the price elasticity of demand for your product is determined. So what this, what this means is that you're going to have to make a determination of, is demand for my firm's product elastic or inelastic? Um, in most every instance, you're not going to be able to do an actual calculation like you do in the textbook because you simply won't have those numbers in the change in quantity and the change in price handed to you. Um, and it's, it will be too, usually it's too hard to get even from the, the resources we have available to us. So you're going to look for other things to sort of help you make this determination in terms of specific information and data. So one piece of data that you can use as a, as a jumping off point is academic research on the price elasticity of demand for your firm's product in general. So if I use the example of General Motors again, they sell automobiles. You could find some economic research done by economists who have studied the price elasticity of demand for automobiles. So you know from our reading in, in this, the chapter on price elasticity of demand that if automobiles are at a certain elasticity, that General Motors, being a specific brand within that market, is going to be even more elastic than that baseline number. So that gives you, you can do that for a lot of products. And, there's lots of lists out there based on economic research giving you like a, an actual number done by economists 
for common products like automobiles and, and clothing and, um, you know, air travel, things like that. So definitely look for that. And that will give you something to work from. And then obviously when you talk about your own firm, that you're going to be narrowing your, um, your definition of the market, which is something we talk about in the next element. And that's going to make it more elastic than what you started at. So another thing you can look at is actual pricing. Um, again, you're not going to be able to do calculation, but you can look at things like how closely do they compete on price with their competitors? Do they try to always be the same as their competitors um, in price? If their competitor offers um, a, a sale or a lower price, do they automatically follow suit? Um, that might indicate elastic demand because they know that if their competition lowers the price, they might lose a lot of customers. So they're eager to not lose those customers, so they feel the need to also lower their price. Um, so you might look for behaviors like that. Or just offering sales in general. Um, if a company is offering sales, and they're doing it because they think it's going to bring in a lot more customers and increase their, their revenue overall. Uh, so that's something that you can look out for, too. Um, any questions on that? I do see some typing here. So... Okay, uh, Donna asked a question of Ellen on her third party research. Um, but if there's no other questions on this, um, just because of the time, I do wanna move on to the next one. This next one is pretty straightforward. Um, it's looking for you to look at the factors of um, consumer responsiveness. So those are basically the determinants of price elasticity of demand. Um, we've got them outlined here. The textbook goes over um, these five determinants. So if you want to really knock this one out of the park, you can just apply each of these determinants to your firm's product or service and explain how, how it impacts price elasticity of demand. Does it, does it lean towards the elastic side for your product or the inelastic side? And after you sort of shake all of these out, it should support what you said in the last paragraph, whether elastic or inelastic. So some of these for the same product might lean in different directions. Well, it's a luxury, so that makes it more elastic, but then it's also a small share of the budget, which makes it um, somewhat inelastic. And one of those is gonna be more important than the other, and it will lean more that way. So those are the kinds of things that you're gonna be looking for in that section. But overall, I think students tend to do a pretty good job on this one and they really understand how each of these bulleted points of the determinants of demand um, apply to their company's products. All right, so we've got a couple more minutes um, for this last one. So this last one, again, um, is pretty straightforward. At this point in, in this milestone, you've already determined and supported, ev given evidence and analysis to support your determination of Elastic demand or inelastic demand. So you already know what you're working with. Now you're going to assess how the price elasticity of demand impacts the firm's pricing decisions. So one of the things that we were introduced to in this chapter on price elasticity is the relationship between price elasticity and total revenue. So we've got the video linked here um, in, the, in the guide. This is from your textbook, so it's nothing new, um, but just an, an easy way to grab it right here so you can make that connection. And whether it's inelastic or elastic, you can talk about how a price change under that specific kind of elasticity, either inelastic or elastic, is going to affect your company's revenue. So if they were to increase their price, given their kind of elasticity, how would that impact their revenue? Um, if they were to decrease their price, how would that impact their, their revenue? So again, if once you've got the elasticity determined from the first element in this section, um, these next two are generally uh, pretty straightforward for students, as long as you remember to include them. Some students do forget, um, which is why we have the webinar and we make sure that you understand all of the um, pieces that you need to hit. But we are right at nine o'clock. Um, so thank you all so much for coming, Eco 201 students. Again, this was recorded and um, we will be sharing it um, sometime tomorrow, all your instructors will have it posted up. And I'm going to go ahead and get started with our ECO 202 students. Um, 
Anyone who's here for Eco 202, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We're just wrapping up with the 201 folks. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out their guide and open up your guide. And you're welcome everyone from 201. I really appreciate all the questions, that was great. All right. Let me grab for you all the Milestone 2 template. for ECO 202, and we will get right into it. Perfect. All right, so for our 202 students, um, this is a shorter milestone than the last one, um, so that's good news for you. We only have three critical elements to cover in this milestone, um, and they're all related to fiscal policy. So again, when you submit your milestone, um, if you're submitting it just as these slides, you'll still want to keep your presentation slide um, so your instructor knows that you've got the right file submitted um, and have your name and you can let them know it's milestone two right here. And then from there, you're going to go right into the first element um, of this assignment. So again, this is all on fiscal policy. Um, and this template here, this, this guide that's shared with all of you in the course as well, um, does give you a brief overview of some of the, um, the resources that you can use. But the focus here is that you're going to look at the fiscal policies that were in place at the beginning of your time period, the 10-year time period that you chose. So one thing I'd like to remind students of in this webinar is to, is to keep in mind what we, were, what we mean when we say fiscal policy. So fiscal policy is not just any government spending. So the government spends money on all sorts of things um, that have nothing to do with impacting the economy. Fiscal policy is intended to have some sort of economic impact, whether it's just keeping the economy stable, um, responding to a recession, responding to inflation, things like that. So when, when the government spends money on um, unemployment benefits or um, Social Security, things like that, those, those are called, a lot of that is called automatic stabilizers. Um, those are meant to keep the economy stable um, during ups and downs. Um, so that stuff is kind of happening all the time behind the scenes. It's just done automatically, um, moves, you know, kind of against the grain of the business cycle. But then the, and then, and of course, you know, a, as you know, there are tweaks here and there to all those sorts of, of tax rates or um, benefit, benefit amounts that, that the federal government allows for things like unemployment insurance and, um, or, or Social Security payouts. Um, so there are changes made to those, but for, for the most part, they sort of just chug right along. Um, but if there are any, are any changes to that in your time period, that those are the kinds of things you want to look at. But other major fiscal policy actions usually come from a response to some sort of major economic event. So, um, of course, we had one of those back in 2008, um, but almost every single time period has some sort of economic story that the federal government uh, needs to respond to. So, for fiscal policy, when they respond to some sort of economic event, um, whether it's a recession or high inflation or um, what have you, they have two main tools that they use to, to correct for those things. Um, spending, government spending, and taxation. So they're, they're basically broken up into two, two categories. Um, one is contractionary. Those are actions, fiscal policy actions that will make the economy contract or become smaller. So you would do that if you thought the, the economy was getting overheated and maybe there's a lot of inflation. And then there's expansionary fiscal policies which uh, help the economy grow faster. And those are the kinds of things that are put in place during uh, a downturn or a recession. So you'll be looking at actions that spending changes, so spending cuts or spending increases, 
and tax cuts or tax increases that are meant to do um, to be expansionary or contractionary in response to some sort of economic event that happened in your decade. So the policies in place at the start of your decade might have been in response to something that had happened maybe a few years prior. So you just want in this in this first element when you're talking about the fiscal policy, you just kind of want to get a baseline for where things are at the beginning of your time period. And the reason we want you to do this is because we know that it's going to change. So we want to understand how the fiscal policy evolved over your time period. So we need to know how it began to see how it changed. Um, and we want to understand why it changed. So in this first element, you're going to explain sort of what the policies were at the time and why they were that way. So if there was, if there happened to be expansionary fiscal policy in place at the time, um, you know, why, what was the reason for that? And then we can see how that evolved over the next 10 years. And again, we've got some links here um, where you can start some of your research. Um, and one of the things that we always recommend is to search by president. So hopefully by this point, you know all the presidents that were in place during your 10 year time period. Um, so you can search for their fiscal policies. Um, this is not something you can cite, but it's, a, it's actually often a good jumping off point is Wikipedia. So if you were to say search Ronald Reagan Wikipedia, um, you know, they've got a huge page on every president. You can scroll down to the, the section on their economic policies um, and you can read about their fiscal policies. And from there, they do cite to some reputable academic sources that you could then use. Um, you could go to those, those, those real sources that Wikipedia cites, um, read through those, and then use those as a reference for, for your project. But um, in terms of finding the information, Wikipedia is often a good start, starting point. And then these here as well. But if you're just doing a simple um, browser search, searching by presidents, you would say Reagan fiscal policy or Bush fiscal policy um, instead of you know, 1984 fiscal policy. Um, so Eric says that the links don't work for him. Um, Eric, I believe it is up. It is shared with you all as an actual PowerPoint. That way, if you want to use the the sort of um, this as a template with you know, with the actual headings and everything, you can actually build right in here. Um, to get the links to work, you just put it on slideshow view, and then the links auto work. But yeah, we we did share it as a PowerPoint, um, so you can actually use the document. For, for your stuff if you'd like to, but yeah, the downside to that is that the links only work in slideshow. But hopefully that, um, that fixes it. And all these things, if you just Google Congressional Budget Office, it, it just takes you to the main page. Good, I'm glad that worked. All right, so the next one, um, which I've talked a bit about already, is the fiscal policy actions. So these are the actions that are taken after you sort of set that baseline from the last critical element um, from the last slide. So we kind of understand how things were at the start, but then things are going to happen in the economy and Congress and the president are going to decide that some things need to change. They want to increase or decrease spending. They want to increase or decrease taxes. Those are the main ways. Um, and you'll see what sorts of things they did and why. So, all right, so I'm just making sure I'm not missing any questions. Thank you, Melissa, for helping out with that. So we've got um, a couple additional things here. So this is the part where you're going to dig a little bit deeper in terms of applying the, uh, the macroeconomic models that we've been building um, in the course for, for this week. So one of them, well, th we've got two listed here. We've got the ADAS model which is um, probably the most versatile, the most easy, the easiest for students to use. Um, and we also have the Keynesian consumption function. So either of those can sort of help you explain, you know, why is decreasing taxes an expansionary fiscal policy? How is that going to help in a recession? Well, you can use these models to explain why. So we want to make sure, not, not that you just can look up the history of you know, economic policy, which is important to understand, but also use the principles and the models that we're developing and, and studying in our textbook 
to explain why these things are done and why they work. Um, Crystal, before I go on, I don't want to miss um, your concerns. Hopefully everyone else can hear me. <laughs> um, yeah, I would jump, jump out and jump back in um, if that persists. If anybody else is having any trouble hearing me, please let me know if I'm not, if I'm not speaking loudly enough. Uh, so to help you guys out with um, incorporating some of these, we do have links that are embedded here. Again, all the stuff, all these um, these links that are not to research websites um, or data websites go to our textbook. So there are videos um, generally from the textbook that help explain these. Um, for instance, these these models and how they lead to the, the desired outcome. Uh, so this is just sort of a shortcut for you, but all this stuff is in your textbook anyway. Uh, as always, you're going to try to keep the main points on the slide. Um, in any graphs, of course, would go on the slide. Some students are pretty successful just drawing a simple ADA, um, ADAS graph of their own on right on the slide. Um, so that's totally welcome. Um, that way you can show, you know, let's, we'll use the example of a tax cut. How does the tax cut look in the model? What's moving in the model? And then how does that change the equilibrium point? Because once you see a shift in the AD or AS line, then you're going to have a new equilibrium point and see what that impact is. Okay, did that, let's see, on the model will show us how that impacted the price level and how it impacted GDP. And um, one thing I do want you to keep in mind, because I, I really do encourage students to include um, a graph of the model and, and show that you can really move it around and, and, and interpret it. Um, so I want you to keep in mind, because unemployment is one of the major things that um, the federal government responds to with fiscal policy, that that GDP at the bottom is also sort of is also a proxy for unemployment. So as GDP increases, we're making more stuff. Right. In general, you know, we have more output in the economy. Generally, when we have more output in the economy, more people are working to produce that output. So when GDP increases, typically we also see employment increasing, which is a decrease in unemployment. So when you're looking for the desired outcome, if the desired outcome is lower unemployment, um, then, for instance, the ADAS model, if it shows an increase in GDP, you could say that that goes along with the outcome of, of having higher employment. So I just want to keep, have you all keep that in the back of your minds because it's not, it's not on the graph of the model itself, but those two things are linked, the GDP and the, and the amount of employment in the economy. All right. And just as a note, um, a lot of the scholarly research that you did from the first element, for instance, like if you're doing the 1980s and you're looking at President Reagan, um, he was the president for eight years. So if you're studying all of his fiscal policies, you might find all that in one spot from the research above. And so a lot of that is going to apply here. You might not need to redo all of your work from that first element. Um, so there might be some overlap there. So um, other than any graph that you show, you'll want to you'll want to talk about um, you might mention the names, Jonathan, of the policies. So a lot of times they they have specific names like a bill that was passed um, or the name of the budget bill. A lot of times they have like omnibus with some number. Um, and then what what the the bill or the policy did, did it did it increase the payroll tax? Did it increase spending on um, spending, the, or did it increase money that the federal government gives to states so that states can hire more people to help during a recession? So things like that. So, you know, again, the, the general buckets are spending and taxes, but what kinds of spending, what kinds of taxes? What taxes were increased? Okay, well, what taxes were increased? Um, so those are the kinds of bullet points you could include on the slide along with any graph that you do and any um, and then the desired outcome. So this tax, the payroll tax was increased in order to 
slow down inflation. That would be the kind of thing that you would put on the slide if that were the case. And then maybe you'd have the ADAS model to show how that might work. And then in your, in your notes section of the slide, which I know we talked a lot about in our last webinar, in your notes section is where you're going to go into a lot more detail about that, about you know what the, what the bill was aimed at and, and what it was trying to do. So basically, this is more what I'm saying um, is almost just basic, basic PowerPoint stuff, not so much on how you'll be graded. Um, so whenever you do a PowerPoint slide, you don't want to have a ton of text on the page. Probably what I have here is as much as you would want to go. <laughs> I'm not always good about getting all the text off the page, um, but because this is for you all to read at home, um, it's not just for me to present, then I want to make sure everything's on there. But um, typically, a PowerPoint presentation um, just wants the basics on the slide, and then you, you talk about the rest. But since you're not presenting your presentation, you're, you're submitting it to Blackboard, um, the notes section does the talking for you. So again, it's, it's not so much about how you're going to be graded in terms of how you break it up, but just practicing good PowerPoint um, etiquette, for lack of a better word. All right, so the last element here is looking at the actual fiscal policy impact. So you've spent the last slide um, talking about some of the different fiscal policies that uh, the administration, administrations probably um, throughout the time period put into place and why they did that um, using the model as, using the models as as an explanation for why that ought to work. But that doesn't always mean that they work. <laughs> um, if it were that simple, then um, we, would, we would never have bad policy. But of course, um, that's not the world that we live in. So we want you to use this, this opportunity to see, well, gosh, did those policies really do what they were supposed to do? Um, you know, the example we give here is the war on poverty, um, you know, did did it work? Did the things that were put in place for the war on poverty, did, did they come to fruition? Was the policy wrong um, that they put in place? Because obviously we still have poverty. <laughs> um, was it not big enough? Um, was, it, was it cut off before it could be effective? So there's lots of reasons that a policy, even though on, in, with the theory on paper, based on the model, it should work, but that it didn't actually work in real life. So size or timing or um, misreading of things are all reasons why they might not work. But then a lot of times, thankfully, they do get it right and it does have the intended impact. Um, so you've got your economic data from the first milestone. So you can see how the unemployment rate changed, how the GDP growth rate changed, and how the inflation rate changed um, every year of your chosen time period. So you can kind of see, well, did they reach their outcome? You've already got the data, so now you're just gonna kind of put those two together and, um, and see if it worked. Uh, and if it did, you maybe you know, talk, explain a little bit why, and if it didn't, give some explanation as to why maybe it didn't work. Yes, and Melissa, that's, that's exactly right. Um, so the policy actions are the things that, that change throughout your decade um, from that baseline that you discuss in the very first element where you say, this is how things started off at my time period, and then there's going to be new actions, new bills, new laws that come down the line um, throughout the 10-year time period in response to new economic events. So Eric says, I'm struggling to discuss the impacts of policy, for example, the tax reduction Simpli of Simplication Act 77. It changed the standard deduction and general tax credit, but I can't find anything that discusses how it impacted the economy as a whole. Um, so in that, in that instance, Eric, um, and I'm not familiar enough off, just off the top of my head with that specific bill, um, it's, it's hard for me to tell if that was just to make things more simple or if it was meant to actually have 
um, an impact on the overall economy. So it, it could be that you're not able to find an impact on the overall economy because that wasn't the intent. Um, but without, without researching it a little bit more myself, I, I don't want to mislead you, but I, I do want to open you up to that possibility. Um, so generally speaking, if there's some sort of um, policy put in place, it should be in response to something. So if this, this might have just been done as, let's clean things up, this, this tax stuff is kind of a mess, um, you know, maybe we can simplify it. That's sort of what that title is, is saying to me, but, but again, I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with that, that bill to, to say definitively if that's the case. So if it impacted taxpayers on an individual level, that's that's a good point. Um, you might want to see what kind of taxpayer. Did it impact, um, you know, low-income households? Did it impact um, people with children, or or you know, which segment of of individuals did it did it happen to impact? Um, salaried workers, or or what have you? And then you you can sort of make extrapolations from there. So. When we know from, from our textbook that certain segments of, of people have, you know, different propensities to consume. So when lower income households um, get more money, they spend more of it. Um, and when they have less money, that's just less money that gets spent in the economy. Um, higher income households, because they have more ability to save, um, when their income changes, it doesn't necessarily have the same impact on overall spending in the economy because some of that can just impact the saving portion of the economy. So you could look at when it talks about the individual impact on taxpayers, you could still use that to extrapolate to the greater economy. So that might be one way to take it um, if, that's, if that's what you're getting. Uh, yes, uh, Melissa, that that would be that would be one to look at. Yep. Um, again, I I don't know the the details of that policy offhand to give you any any specifics. Um, it's been a long time since I've taught this course, so my economic history is getting fuzzy. But it's definitely something that you'll you'll want to include in your in your in your paper in your project rather. I know I've been I've been teaching Eco 201 for too long. <laughs> but it looks like Ellen might have some. But yeah, that's a major one. And um, there was definitely a lot of changes to um, to taxation in the 80s too, Melissa. I don't know when your time period starts, but um, general a lot of under the Reagan administration, taxes in certain areas went up and taxes in other areas went down. So again, it's sort of like what I was saying with Eric, um, depending on which group of individuals that affected is going to have a different impact in the economy. So that's something to look at too. Yeah, and again, when, when there's a bank failure, just more in general, and you know, this isn't something that we talk a lot about in fiscal policy in general, but that, you know, this was a, a special case. Um, when they go to bail out of banks, that's, you know, to sort of to stabilize things. You don't want people to lose their savings. Um, that impacts consumer confidence um, when things like that happens. And when consumers don't have confidence, they don't shop, they don't spend. Um, we hear about that all the time in the news, the consumer confidence index and things like that. So um, that's certainly, you know, the, the federal government intervened in that space. Um, definitely is a way to stabilize things um, and to protect that that part of the economy. But you're going to go into better detail than I did about, about the specifics of the policy. So, all right. So um, we've only got a few minutes left, but we have covered all of the three elements. Um, so hopefully it's, it's pretty clear. You give a baseline for the fiscal policies that are already in place at the start of your time period. 
The next one discusses how they, what new actions are taken in terms of fiscal policy and why they're taken using the uh, macroeconomic principles and models as sort of your guide. And then you look to see if those policies were, um, were effective. Those are the three things that you're trying to hit on. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Let's slide all the way down to the references. Um, this looks just like our last webinar. Um, again, I, I know I talked about this for those of you who joined us last time, but there is no specific APA format for PowerPoint in general, but you do want your references to still be in APA format. So um, we've got the link here, so there's still going to be an alphabetical order. Um, they're still going to follow the same the same setup in terms of how you structure each citation. So please follow that for um, for this page and uh, make sure that anything that you reference up top is also here down bottom. Yeah, you should still have in text citations. Um, thank you, Jonathan. So most of what you're going to be sharing, especially in the first slide and a lot of in the third slide is going to be um, cited material because you're talking about, you know, you're referencing historical matters that aren't necessarily common knowledge. So you'll need to cite where you got that information. Um, when you talk about the ADAS model, unless you're borrowing a graph from another site, um, you won't cite that. So your knowledge of those models, if you know, if you're going to include those, that's your own. But the rest of the stuff, like the names of the bills, um, that will all be that will all be cited using an in-text citation um, on the slide and in the notes area. And then the reference should show up here for anything that has an in-text citation. Yes, thank you, Kara. That's a that's a good point too. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the elements that you're graded on do need you to be including um, scholarly research to get that full credit once you get to the final, um, once you get to your final draft. Um, obviously, we encourage you to do that here, even though it's just a milestone. Um, but any any time where you can in, include scholarly research, and, and there's a lot out there when it comes to studying, um, you know, federal fiscal policy. You'll, you'll have plenty of opportunity to find that stuff, so. Yep, and um, definitely do not forget the speaker notes. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> we can't ex stress that enough, um, because remember, if you do take a look at the, the grading rubric, um, if you don't include your speaker notes on all of the content slides, that's going to bump you down to the needs improvement category. Um, and the needs improvement, for the milestone is a 75% score, which is a passing score. But that same level, if you don't get those citations in for the final draft, that becomes 55%. Because again, the, the expectations for your milestone are not as strict as the expectations for the final. Once you get to the final, you've gone through all your milestones, you've gotten feedback from your, your instructor, and you've had a chance to make edits. So that's why it's sort of a the stakes are, are increased in terms of um, the level of proficiency that we're looking for. So we don't want you to lose out on points and have elements get bumped down to what's basically a failing grade of 55% just because you forgot to include speaker notes. Um, so Michelle asks about the citations on the slide. So I would keep, um, when you do an in-text citation on the slide, it should be the same font as whatever you're sharing. So if, if I write a bullet point, say something about that, you know, that savings and loan um, crisis uh, fiscal policy bill that, um, that we were discussing, in parentheses, I would have the in-text citation just in, in the same fonts and size that I, that I was writing in. And then the same with the speaker's notes as well. In the, spe in the notes area, you're going to be typing in one size font. And so that'll be more like a paper. You're just going to, your in-text citation is going to look just the same as the rest of the text. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, great question, Lori. Um, yeah. So you don't if you don't need to do anything to milestone one. A lot of students do submit this as one big. They sort of add on to milestone one. Add these slides on. Um, if you've already started that and you're going to submit it that way to your instructor, just know that they're only going to be looking at the slides on fiscal policy. And one other thing um, that I that I'm not sure that I mentioned, um, but I will, even though we're just one minute over, um, the fiscal policy action slide. So that's your your second element that you're graded on for this milestone. For a lot of students, um, this becomes more than one slide, and that's that's quite all right. A lot of students want to discuss. Maybe there's a handful, you know, two or three fiscal policy actions that they want to, uh, that they're discussing in particular, and they want to put them each on their own slide, and that's that's fine. Just like with um, our last module, um, I'm sorry, our last milestone, some of the elements needed um, more than one slide to be fully covered. So if there aren't any other questions, um, Best of luck on your milestone. Uh, I think you guys are all going to do great. Generally, students do pretty well on this. Um, once you find those policies, pretty much from there, you can apply the, the principles and the models that we've discussed, and then it, you're, you're pretty much home free. Um, because I think for most students, they, they do understand you know, why spending changes in government spending or changes in ta taxation would impact the economy. So that's really what we want um, to make sure that you understand. Um, so once you get the research done from there, it's, it's usually pretty easy for students. And if you do feel like you're having any trouble, um, once you do your research, understanding um, the models that we talked about here or just how the economy would be impacted, reach out to your instructor as soon as you can because the, the, that's really where, where they're going to be able to help you most is in understanding the principles um, once you've got the research that you need. All right. Um, sorry, there's one last question. You can watch the videos in the Pearson Lab. All right. So, um, the video, some of the ones that are linked here, I think, is um, what Kiara is referring to. Um, but it's, and Kiara, you, you teach this course almost every term, so you probably remember the chapter number. Um, but in, in my lab, under, um, under Module 4, once you're in the actual my lab, um, they've got all the videos that align with the major objectives of the fiscal policy chapter. So again, a couple of these are linked here. So the ADS model is here that will link you to that video and then the Keynesian consumption function. Um, and then the impact on the economy is that video is here. They're really short videos. They're usually just a couple of minutes long. Hope that, hope that helps clear that up. Oh, good. Glad you found him. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I would definitely take a look at those. Um, and actually, sometimes it really helps. I don't know if you have if you haven't done the chapter reading yet, but I find that a lot of students benefit from checking out the videos because they're generally really quick, checking out the videos and then doing the chapter reading. Um, sometimes if you if you watch the quick video first and you sort of get introduced to the topic, then you read through it in the textbook, it sinks in a little bit better. So um, that might be one strategy to do tonight, tomorrow. Um, and then from there, you'll feel really good about jumping into the research and the writing. Yep, we will um, get the recording to all the faculty um, as early tomorrow as possible so that they can get it into the class um, as soon as they can. But definitely at some point tomorrow. Oh, good. I'm glad, Melissa, that my that my theory was <laughs> was correct. I went to um, actually with with Kate. I don't know if Kate is still on. No, were you there, Kate? Um, to an 
economics teaching conference where um, some of the presenters were talking about the use of video in the classroom to help with uh, reading comprehension. So there was some evidence to back it up, but it's always great to hear from students. No, you weren't there, Kate. It was um, Val. Val, another instructor, was with me at that conference, but it was really uh, interesting stuff, and that was one of the things that we learned, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, yeah, the, the voice on the videos is a little, um, a little sleepy, <laughs> but better than nothing, I guess. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for coming, and um, if you have any questions about your assignment or about um, any, any portions of uh, the, the milestone, um, I'm sorry, the module work for this week covering, covering fiscal policy, please reach out to your instructor as soon as you can. Good night, everybody.